Okay, so I'm just going to start off um, with a brief, uh, brief history for me. Um, I started, I started, um, you know, right from an early age, I always felt like there was something wrong with me, I couldn't connect with the world. Uh, and almost like I felt like I was an alien in this world. Um, and I was always thinking about what was wrong with me. Later on, um, you know, I started to feel feelings of self-hatred, self-loathing. Uh, and uh, as a child, I thought maybe this was because I was fat or maybe it was because uh, the color of my skin was different to other children around me. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, I did find though when I ate food that that gave me a sense of comfort. And that was my main uh, comforting mechanism, mechanism as a child was to overeat on food and uh, and in that way I got a lot of comfort and I enjoyed being on my own as a child uh, and and either reading fantasy books or watching fantasy films uh, like sci-fi uh, just to escape into another world while I was eating and uh, being by myself. Uh, at primary school uh, to show how serious the problem was getting uh, at the end of primary school, they give you a medical checkup, and um, uh, and uh, I was referred to at that young age uh, uh, to a fat clinic in Finchley, London, where uh, I'd go there once a month, and I'd have to get on the um, get on the scales. They they'd uh, measure me, take my measurements, and they'd have these big kind of metal, almost like pliers, to measure how many inches of fat. And I always remember very clearly those metal, uh, those metal pliers sort of digging into the fat around my stomach and feeling the cold metal as they measured how many inches. I was totally like fuzzed out in the food. They gave me diet sheets and advice, which I totally ignored and just carried on binging. Uh, in my teens, um, I started, you know, I had the teenage hormones. I started to think uh, girls were attractive. And then there was this thought, you know, you're fat, you're ugly, you're hideous. Um, and uh, and uh, also to top it all, in my teens, my mother came in one day, it was very traumatic, and said, you've got bad breath. Also in my teens, my mid-teens, I started losing my hair, I was going bald. So my inner dialogue was, you're fat, you're balding, and you have bad breath. So there was no self-esteem. Uh, but I did have this one thought, uh, which was like, uh, you could try going on a diet to lose the weight. Somehow that was my only hope. If I went, if I got a diet book and I, um, I could get thin enough, maybe that would be the solution to this inner uh, agony that I had. Um, so that started one diet after another, after another. Um, I went through a diet where I was just eating huge amounts of fiber, like all bran. Uh, and um, the result of that was constipation and having medical treatment at the hospital. I tried extreme vegan diets, living on fruits and salad. That resulted in me being diagnosed with anemia and having medical treatment uh, for anemia. So as I tried one extreme diet after another, uh, my health, you know, I was starting already to get health problems. You know, that kind of extreme behavior uh, carried on. Uh, uh, in um, in uh, at university, I had just one friend, one male friend, and he said, "Like, you know, there's no, I was studying biochemistry. There's no money in biochemistry. Let's go and get a job in the stock market." So we both went off and got a career in the stock market after a degree. Um, and I remember on the first day of um, of working, uh, getting uh, landing a, a job in the Docklands in, in London. Um, the director of the company came up and said to me, uh, you know, we need, uh, we need, uh, we need buy reports on these uh, stocks. And, um, and there was, um, you know, and so, you know, I, I had this feeling, sinking feeling like, you know, I just have to do, um, I just have to write these buy reports. And, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, I, I had this sinking feeling. I didn't like the work I was doing. 
and I also felt it also, uh, in, in some respects, that job tested my integrity. Uh, and so I had a great coping mechanism, which was that, um, you know, I could, uh, at the end of the day, go to um, central London, to those buffet restaurants, and just to uh, binge out on my feelings of shame, worthlessness, self-hatred, and doing a job that I didn't enjoy. And so I did. Uh, and I also found that, you know, as the food, even though I was, I was now binging out in those buffet restaurants for oblivion, just to totally, um, you know, escape this world. So kind of suicidal binge eating. And I was doing the, um, doing the, um, the extreme workalism, I found adrenaline addiction uh, in the stock market, just working at high intensity, that would numb me out. I had the food addiction to numb me out in the evenings. And I also, um, also went into a third addiction, sex and love addiction. So these three addictions I was using just to numb the inner pain of not, fi not fitting into this world. Uh, the age of, um, yeah, so at, uh, I was about age 30 uh, on a business flight back from New York to London and suddenly my feet started swelling up like balloons. Quite literally, I had to take my shoes off because my feet were swelling that rapidly. But on arrival to London, my mother was horrified when she saw my feet. I had a blood test. I was immediately admitted to the Royal Free Hospital with, um, with kidney failure, acute kidney failure. Quite literally, I'd lost about 70% um, of my kidney function in about 24 hours. Literally, my kidneys were failing extremely fast. The doctors were rushing around, uh, taking about 10 tubes of blood at a time to the various departments to figure out what was going wrong. And I knew that uh, you know, I was dying. I was facing death. If these doctors didn't find out how to halt my kidney failure, I'd be leaving soon, and I realized that. And, uh, you know, in that hospital bed, you know, it was like... Um, almost like my life was starting to flash before my eyes as I was coming to terms with my mortality. And that there was only one place left to turn. You know, I had looked to food, I had looked to extreme workalism, I'd looked to sex and love addiction to find salvation. And there was, a, you know, in that hospital bed, there was only one place I could turn and I turned to God. And that fear and that thinking at 100 miles an hour I had a spiritual awakening in that hospital bed. It went into a, a heavenly timeless stillness. The thoughts went silent. The fear evaporated all in a split second. And I experienced, you know, I had a spiritual awakening. I experienced a higher love. I call it the love of God. I mean, I'd looked for love and connection in food, people, places, and situations. And I'd found this you know, awakening to, the, to God's love. It was electrifying. I knew in my heart that that was the love that I'd been looking for outside of myself in the world. My whole life was the love of God, which was found inside when I surrender. It was electrifying. The, the doctors stabilized my condition. They released me. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I went on a huge spiritual journey to different types of spiritual groups uh, uh, and uh, exploring. I had a mentor there. He told me, watch this DVD. I put the DVD on. And I had my second profound spiritual experience. It was like a, a tingling up my spine and a feeling of bliss. And I knew I had to meet this man. So I flew out to America, uh, to Sedona, Arizona, to meet this man. And um, meeting, it was like meeting an emissary for God. In his presence, I'd just go into a state of infinite peace and bliss. And I knew whatever he was saying, um, I needed to do what he said. Uh, he was... He, he had um, a man named Bill W, uh, who was, um, uh, who's well known uh, in the foundings of the 12 steps. And um, he was one of his sponsees. So um, it was like God was leading me to the right person to hear the message of what the 12 steps could do to me. Um, I came back to um, the UK, got my sponsor. And when I got my sponsor, um, from my central London meeting here in London. Um, you know, uh, I felt like uh, that was another mystical experience. It was, uh, I won't go into it, but it was like God gave me the intuition to ask this man to be my sponsor and I did. He said, yes. And I knew that, you know, I needed to work these steps because uh, my health was gone 
and uh, I was in hell. And I knew that these steps would, uh, intuitively I knew they would give me a connection, a consistent connection to the love of God, which would, and also the potential for miracles, which I started to experience. So I worked those steps like my life depended upon it, like a dying man. If my sponsor had said, look, you need to go climb the roof and jump up and down, because that's part of the program, I'd have done that. I was that desperate. And I went, I gave the steps and my sponsor hundred percent. There wasn't anything he said that I didn't do. I was willing to go to any lengths. Uh, within three months, I'd finished the steps. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I gave it 100%. And I knew intuitively from my spiritual experience that I could not go, I could, you know, to be absent means that I should not go to food for a hit. I should not use food as a mood altering thing. Any type of food or any type of eating behavior, which gave me any kind of high or hit, I had to get that from working the program and from God only. I wanted to be in a position of absolute neutrality. And it was explained to me uh, that, um, you know, if I stop using the food, all my feelings are gonna come up. And, uh, and that I, I had to feel those feelings and not use no matter what. So I had, uh, I, I had uh, started with three meals a day without any trigger foods. It was just bland, wholesome, three meals, not overeating a day. And within a short period of time, extreme feelings came up. I was and I had a panic attack in the middle of the night. I woke up, I couldn't breathe. And I, I had said to myself, no matter what, I will not pick up on the food, even if I die. And in that kind of, um, I won't make an excuse, but you know, an excuse might be that kind of half unconsciousness when I woke up with a panic attack, couldn't breathe. I went into the kitchen and I binged and I was horrified. And I said uh, to myself, the next time you get a panic attack and you can't breathe, um, just sit on that chair and do not pick up the food no matter what. And if you die, I'd, you know, I'd rather die um, meeting God in heaven abstinent. And I knew God was infinite love. So there was no problem with that, but I will not pick up. I had another panic attack um, the next day, you know, and, and the thoughts were going, just, just binge, just binge, you can't breathe. And, I, and I'd said to myself, I'll sit on that chair and if this panic attack kills me, I'll die of it, but I will not pick up the food no matter what, for the love of God. And uh, it, was, it was horrific, absolutely horrific, the most extreme feelings probably the, the most extreme feeling I ever felt in my whole life. But after about 15 minutes of just sitting in that chair, being willing to die for the love of God, um, I, I could start to breathe again and the panic attack passed. And that was about the start. Uh, I think this is very important for about 12 years of abstinence in my food recovery. I've not had uh, food obsession, not, not had body obsession for 10 years straight and only one day of food obsession in 10 years. It's an absolute miracle to be in a position of neutrality around food and body. And there's a thing that's mentioned in the big book, which is to be in a position of neutrality around my addiction. Uh, and also, uh, you know, to, to be in that position of neutrality. And I knew intuitively that when, when I'm blissed out, if I'm working the program so hard, praying, meditating, carrying a message of hope to those who are still suffering with addiction, that if I, you know, that I knew from my own experience that if I work the program to such a high velocity, every aspect of the program, that of course, you know, that, that peace and that love of God is gonna silence my, all my thoughts into the present moment, gonna give me an inner feeling of absolute love and happiness. I don't need to get that through using anything. No, no food, no exercise machine, no person, place or situation in the world is needed to get that hit. I can get that directly just by uh, getting conscious contact with the love of God. And that has worked. Uh, in the early days, um, I remember giving service. I took one sponsee on and um, I noticed that there was a miracle in my life, like God relieved one area of my life. I took another sponsee and had another miracle. It was like God was removing problems from my life every time I took on another sponsee. I remember uh, I, I had seven sponsees and another person asked me, said, will you sponsor me? And I said, yes. It was like every time I gave more service, it was like, you know, I work for God. And every time I, I did more work for God, God rewarded me with a miracle. It had always happened. 
And I remember I was um, then on a dialysis machine eight hours a day to keep me alive. And I said yes to this person. And two days later, I had a phone call in the middle of the night from my hospital saying, we have a kidney transplant for you. Come on straight in. They gave me that kidney transplant. Uh, and um, I knew that was God saying, look, you, you do my business and I'll take care of your business. And I, I, and I had that successful kidney transplant. I'm off the dialysis machine. Um, I don't use walking sticks any longer. I don't use asthma inhalers. I'm not obese, uh, not for a long time. And um, yeah, you know, miracles are possible when I work, uh, when I work this program. So I'm so grateful. Uh, the main thing is just getting a sponsor and working those steps. And um, I'm grateful as willing to do whatever it took. Thank you.